Welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. Today we have a very special guest, Mr. Roy Thomas. Roy, uh, Roy and I have actually been in a couple of the same uh, documentaries and another project that can't talk about but will be released next month. Roy, thanks so much for joining us today. Sure, yeah, happy to. First, I want to say thanks, John Cimino, for setting up the interview. We got about six questions we'd love to get through over the next uh, 30 minutes, which, uh, which you have in your day today. Sure. All right. The first question, which I'm going to give a little setup for, that uh, Roy Thomas started uh, in the fanzines and, uh, and fandom uh, in the early 60s with uh, his cohort, uh, Jerry Bales. He was a teacher in the mid-60s, left to go to New York uh, to uh, write comics, worked with uh, Mort Weisinger over at DC, the Superman comics editor, for a couple weeks, then went over to Marvel and worked with Stan Lee, where his uh, legacy in, uh, in comics writing began. Roy, can you tell us uh, kind of w- why you left the Weisinger um, purview over for Stan Lee, and what about the working with Stan Lee in the 60s did you find more interesting? Yeah. Well, Weisinger uh, was, you know, a talented guy, but uh, as I discovered when I got there, uh, was just very, very difficult to, to, uh, to work for. He, he, liked to, he was just one of these people uh, that, who liked to browbeat, you know. He browbeat his artists, he browbeat his uh, his writers, and he browdied his assistants and so forth, and I was just the latest uh, in the line. Uh, he, and I don't know, I, I guess I could have survived working for him, but I just, I, I've never reacted too well to these overbearing personalities that think just because they're the boss, you know, they get to say everything and, and uh, you know, and order you around and so forth. I, I was pretty subservient. I was there to, to learn. I, I didn't have any idea that you know, I I knew it all coming in, but I wanted to be treated like a human being, and I didn't feel that he wa- he liked to treat people. I mean, he was a, a vicious, nasty guy, talented mm-hmm. enough in his own way, but vicious and nasty. And it it got to it, in just a period of about a week or so. You know, it it was really depressing to me because I if I got to spend the rest of my life working for this uh, verbal sad masochist, you know, or a sadist rather, not masochist. <laughs> I was, you know, and. Uh, but, you know, but I had no way to get away. I mean, what I was looking forward to was the fact that Julius Schwartz, who was his childhood friend, but a fellow editor on a little, just a little lower plane with Justice League and Reed Lantern and all that, um, you know, he had expressed an interest in my working for him. When I look back, I think that's kind of weird because these editors at DC then were so jealous that, you know, they didn't, they didn't like their writers, their artists working for anybody else. But somehow or other, uh, Morton didn't seem to have any trouble working for me uh, for me working for Julie Schwartz, uh, as opposed to just doing Superman stories. Uh, but of course I didn't stick around long enough to see how any of that would play out. Uh, but I intended to, I was going to try to last it out, but I wanted to be, you know, Stan Lee because, uh, I'd only exchanged a couple of letters with him and he sent me an issue of Spider-Man. I'd somehow missed on the stands once, but you know, and he'd seen a few of my fanzine articles and this and that, but, and I'd send him an issue or so of alter ego that I had done in the last year. Uh, and he'd seen Jerry Bales as before, but you know we had no real connection the way say Julie Schwartz and I did. But I wanted to take him out, you know, wanted to like meet him for a drink just because I thought he was the best writer. Much as I loved Gardner Fox and the other people, I I thought he was doing the best writing in comics. Uh, I wasn't even thinking about editing because you know, I didn't didn't know what an editor did exactly just yet. And uh, but and so he I wrote him a letter, you know, and and he called me at uh, my hotel, uh, and I said, uh, you know. Uh, and he says, he, he is, you know, he lives out in Long Island. He doesn't really socialize much. But, you know, when I take this writer's test, you know, cause they've been looking for a writer. And, I, of course, I wasn't looking for a job. I had a job. But it's hard to resist. Somebody tells you, why don't you take a writing test? Just write a few pages that come by and pick up some stuff and then do this stuff and so forth. And, you know, it's kind of a challenge. A guy asks you to write that for some characters you like. And uh, so I did it. And, you know, without meeting Stan and. Eventually, uh, within a day or so, you know, they called me at D.C. and had me come over to meet Stan. And about, uh, you know, uh, Stan was just, you know, very friendly. He was on, you know, he was really, you know, hitting me with all the stuff of how great Marvel was. Of course, I knew that or I wouldn't have wanted to meet him in the first place. And uh, but, you know, he would just talk about stuff. And the only part of our conversation I really remember uh, was when I asked him, how did readers feel about the continued stories? That had been kind of a controversy in fandom because he'd started doing continuing stories more in the comics mm. uh, fairly recently. And uh, he said, oh, they hate him. He, says, <laughs> he just admitted to me, he said, they hate him. But he said, uh, you get most of our mails against it, but I'm going to keep on doing them because it's the only way I can write all these comics every month is if I sort of 
you know, I'm starting from a cliffhanger or some kind of something for the next month. I don't have to start from scratch all the time thinking yeah. where we're going to go. So, so, and that's all I remember until he suddenly, you know, turned around and stand up, you know, I'm in a big office, bigger than Weisinger's. It took up about two thirds of the space at Marvel. It was just his office. And he's looking out the window, the fourth or fifth floor, or wherever it was. And he's looking down Nassau Avenue and he says, so what do we have to do to hire you away from national? Which is what, you know, they called DC then. And uh, I said, I'll oh, just offer me a job. I said, I hate it there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I said, they, they reduced the amount of money. I was supposed to get 110 a week. And now then they, when I got here, he said it was 100. And uh, I said, what happened to the other $10? And he said, well, I can't pay you more than I pay that idiot down the hall, the guy he was firing for me to replace. I guess he could have paid me more if I wasn't an idiot. But anyway, that was the explanation. So when Stan offered me the 110, I said, okay, but I got to give him notice. You know, I said, I won't leave him in the lurch. And he said, well, I want you to start right away, but, you know, you as soon as you can. It takes a week, two weeks, three weeks, okay. But as soon as you can. So I went there, and as soon as I told Mort that I had accepted a job, but that I would stick around as long as he needed me, he said, get out. You're a spy for Stan Lee. You know, he kicked <laughs> me out of the office. We said, do not throw me in the, in the tar patch, you know, or the, the briar patch. You know? It sounds like it was the, the fact of writing stories with continuity, and that was a main appeal. All right, Jim. Okay, so... Um, you graduated from Southeast Missouri State in 1961 with a degree in education, and then you mm -hmm. worked for a few years as a high school English teacher, right? Four, four years, yeah. For four Two years, years. Four, okay. Four years, yeah. When, when you took over Avengers with uh, issue 35, and you had done some other Marvel stuff, but that was where I really came into reading uh, you. I was an Avengers fan, and I was like six, mm -hmm. six years old, seven years old at the time. And you had a run until issue 104, during which time yeah. you created the Vision, Black Knight, uh, and both of those I realized had precursors uh, and Ultron. Um, when you took over the Avengers, I thought thought that you brought a a literary awareness to the comic that wasn't there before. That that uh, they grew up under your influence. And I want to specifically cite and ask you about Avengers 57 and 58, uh, because in, in those, you, you have these, uh, the masterful quote, uh, Shelley's quote from Ozymandias. Well, not the quote, the whole, the whole blame sonnet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and it's a beautiful page. One of my favorites in comics. It was just a happy accident. Yeah. And Bushima was amazing in that. Um, you yes, have this striking language at the end of, of 58 with even an android can cry that we, we all mm -hmm. remember as one of your favorite moments. Were you deliberately trying to raise the standard of comics in that? And were you acting as a teacher, bringing us some literary awareness? And how did all that work using it as under the Marvel method? Those would be my, my initial yeah, questions yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, I didn't like teaching as such. But I think I have a, a certain kind of, you know, teaching mentality in the sense that I, I love the idea of people learning things, learning history, learning literature, you know, uh, you know, learning anything. I mean, obviously, you know, math and science, too, you know. Uh, I'd always liked that in comics, you know, some of the DC comics, Julian, things would, would like to throw that in. Stan wasn't really big on doing this, uh, and he didn't really have the educational background, you know, he's in everything. I, but I didn't have a great education background. I mean, I just had this. B.S. an education degree, you know, with, with uh, you know, in, in English and social sciences and uh, history, and then a big minor in the useless education stuff. And, uh, but I guess I, I, I think both on one level, I was just trying to get in there and just, you know, do more of the same. I liked what Stan was doing, and I was wanting to do more of it and earn my keep and uh, have fun at the same time. On the other hand, because I was different from Stan, because, you know, I, I had a, a college education, not that it was some great college education or whatever, but, you know, I had turned down a, a fellowship in uh, foreign relations at George Washington U to come go to work in comics. Uh, you know, I wasn't, I was going to become a college professor or, or a diplomat or some damn thing, probably. So, therefore, I would, you know, I just naturally brought what, we all bring the tools we have. When Denny O'Neill came in, you know, he had been a reporter, so he brought in this feeling of front page stuff, and I think that's why he was able to, you know, do such nice stuff, say, with the Green Lantern, Green Arrow series. We all brought, you know, my friend Gary Friedrich was a little more hip and, you know, anti-war, and so he would do these uh, Sergeant Furies with more of an anti-war theme. You know, we all bring our background into the thing, and uh, I wasn't trying to raise comics a lot. I thought it was already, it was already kind of going up, you know, Stan had sort of was raising the level of comics in a certain way simply by 
writing what he was doing and making the characters more believable, being human, to go along with all that uh, wonderful Kirby, Ditko, Romita art. And I was simply trying to, you know, to do my own version, but my own version would be a little more academic and a little more literary inclined, simply because that was my inclination, even though I certainly didn't have a heavy literary background. Did you meet any resistance to that? Did Stan say, what the heck are you doing? No, it, in fact, the first story I ever wrote uh, of a superhero, I deliberately put in like a uh, big word or two, like phantasmagorical, which had never been in proper comics before. And he left that in without a word. And he said, he said, hey, this is good. This is, you know, it's in the middle of a sentence. You can tell what it means. If you don't know what it means, they'll read right past it, as long as it didn't interflow with the, interfere with the flow of the story. Uh, no, Stan was open to that as long as it didn't get in the way of the story. You know, he, he thought it was great. You know, uh, I don't remember if he saw that use of the poem before it went out. He did. He might not have paid too much attention to it. But, you know, as you know, as you probably read, I never intended to use that. I just wrote this ending or, or you know, gave John the ending that picked the last page, a bunch of panels with the kid, you know, and he's kicking the, you know, uh, kicking the head around, like kick the can type of stuff and so forth, you know. And, I just wanted to have this kind of different ending. I hadn't thought about what I'd write there. And then when I saw it, I suddenly thought of, uh, of that poem, which, of course, I hadn't memorized. I just looked it up. And then I actually wrote it out. I wrote it out in longhand on the pages so that the tops of all the panels would be the same length. If you left it to a letter, you know, some of them would be taller or shorter than others because they would face it differently. And I just, so I took the whole design page in, but it was, it was not intended to be that way. Now, in the case of Even an Android Can Cry, it's just the title in a way, but in that case, I actually had the title in mind from the beginning because that's why it's lettered on, on unlike almost every other Marvel comic at that period, the uh, uh, the title, Even an Android Can Cry, is, is you know, written and blazed into a stone wall on the cover. That's because John Buscema had that cover, that title from the beginning. But, you know, it, it just, you know, you get inspired. The vision kind of inspired me because I thought it was kind of an interesting character and I was having fun with it. And that just inspires you to, you know, to just push on and try to do better things. Sounds like uh, Stan was um, encouraging influence. And now the, the third the third question, as far as bringing pulps into the comics, you know, you've read a lot of pulps, you have a lot of pulp history. And of course, I'm referring to Conan, uh, King Conan, Call, um, Red Sonia. You know, one, one question I had about the, the 70s and the early 70s and the um, upsurge of this stuff is, is was the 70s like emotionally depressed and there was a fondness for this type of material like there was in the 1930s? Um, what's your take on on the importation of the pulps and comics and why that appealed to readers at the time? Yeah, it's kind of hard to say. You know, I wasn't really a pulp reader myself because, you know, the pulps were kind of dying by the time that I was, you know, starting to read in the late 40s and things. They were kind of minor. I remember buying and reading a couple of issues of Planet Stories and so forth, but I wasn't a heavy pulp reader. I never saw the shadow pulp or any of that stuff, but as they were reprinting them in the 60s in paperback and different things, and as I would see, uh, I would see pulp magazines at the early comics conventions people had, and they were bringing so many of them out in paperback. I mean, that's obviously Conan, Tarzan, you know, I mean, it's even non-pulp stuff, Lord of the Rings, Doc Savage, The Shadow, they were reprinting all this stuff. And it just occurred to me that bringing that into comics, you know, even that, even pulp stuff would kind of raise the level of what comics had been. So I, I sort of liked that idea. And, and of course, you know, Stan was very influenced by the pulps because he had actually read them as a kid more than I did. Mm. And, uh, you know, he knew who the Avenger was. I would have known who that was even at that stage. And uh, so, you know, again, it's just, uh, I, I don't know. I, we were all, all part of that same zeitgeist. And uh, just, uh, you know, bring in whatever influences we had. The, the pulps in their world were very big then because they were because of all the paperback reprints. And I was just there to, uh, I was picking up a lot of that stuff, reading a little of it. I don't have a lot of uh, tolerance for reading old pulp literature. I've never been able to get all the way through a shadow story. And I could bear, I read one Doc Savage and I never want to read another one or two of those, you know. I love the ideas of them. I just don't, you know, but not the actual prose, you know, I'm not going to want to read that kind of stuff. The one, I didn't even finish the first Howard story for several years that I wrote. And then later on, I discovered, well, I was wrong on that one. <laughs> you know, he was, uh, that there were two of them that were really good in their own ways. Like that uh, Edgar Rice prose with his imagination about the actual prose uh, in the early days. And then Robert E. Howard, who in his own way was a fantastic 
writer. The others were well, written well, you know, and so forth, but it wasn't the kind of stuff I really wanted to read. Uh, but yeah. I thought that bringing that in, that was, uh, we were trying to expand. I felt like we should expand from the superhero standpoint. You can't just keep doing more and more superheroes. They're all the same. So you bring in, you know, you raise level a little bit with, you know, trying to get Tarzan. It took a few years, but we did get it eventually. We, we went after, we got lucky in being able to get Conan, which we didn't think we could get. We, we got totally shot down on Lord of the Rings. Tolkien didn't want to know, or his agents, they didn't want to know from comic books, you know. Yeah. Uh, when I was trying to do adaptations of the, uh, the uh, trying to uh, deal with uh, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, trying to get the rights to the story and was, uh, 2001 was based, the monolith. Uh, uh, the, uh, the very friendly agent of this says, listen, I have to tell you, we'll have to forget about this. I've ne- he's, Arthur Clarke has never yelled at me before. <laughs> You know, when I suggested having one of his stories adapted to a comic book, you know, because some of these guys felt, you know, they, they thought comics you know, were the enemy because they had taken a lot of readers away from the pulp in science fiction magazine. And he said, Arthur C. Clarke wanted to hear nothing of that. And he got really mad. You know, most of them were friendly. Yeah. When I tried to do, uh, when, I, when I wanted to adapt the It story by Theodore Sturgeon, I called him up and took me 20 minutes to raise the nerve to be able to call him, you know, sit, sitting by the phone, this famous writer, even though I hadn't read that much stuff by him, but I loved that one story and I knew he was a good writer. And by the time the conversation was over, I had not only agreed to, you know, to do the story, but it agreed to getting this check sent right away because he needed it for an alimony check. Huh. <laughs> so now, why do you think um, Conan the Barbarian um, was uh, so popular in comparison with the other pulp-related comics of that decade? What, what, what appealed to everybody? Well, I think everything about it from uh, the, the character himself, this kind of, you know, almost archetypal barbarian that you could read almost anything to. You all, almost didn't know what he was thinking, but, you know, you, you, you knew it was going to be end up on the right side, whatever his motives were, he would be on the right and this colorful world that Howard created, the, that yanked everything out of the ancient world, the medieval world, any kind of pre-gun power, you could mix it all together, you know, into one world. You, you changed countries, you were changing centuries, really, you know, <laughs> you know and uh, just, just that anything could happen. You had piracy in a world that didn't look like it was designed for piracy, you know. Uh, you had two or three levels of piracy. You said, a world like that shouldn't have really been able to support that many pirates, but it did. And, uh, <laughs> A minute ago, I discussed your your role as a writer in terms of as a teacher and and literary awareness. I want to talk to you about the influence of pop culture on what you were writing, of of contemporary thought, of social topics. You mentioned Denny O'Neill, but you were doing some of that as as well at the same time. Uh, Specifically, I want to cite uh, two Hulk stories. I said, nobody ever cites Hulk stories. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to. Uh, okay. They shoot Hulks, don't they, in issue 142, yeah. which was yeah. was fairly controversial at the time in some ways. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and then I also, the letters page from, I think it was 147, which also contained one of my very favorite Hulk stories of all time, Heaven is a Very Small Place. So oh, I, want yeah, to talk yeah. a, I want to talk about yeah. those for a minute. It, it okay. seems obvious that the the they shoot hulk story was inspired by tom wolf's uh yes. radical chic evenings uh right. where where leonard bernstein he's telling a story of leonard bernstein and his wife hosting a fundraising party for the black panthers right. um and you turn the black panthers basically into the hulk and have these characters reggie and militia parrington um and it's it's pretty biting uh, satire, and it's 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 very much obviously it owes a lot to Tom Wolfe. And my question would, but you also cite Truman Capote, you cite Norman Baylor in the story. You're bringing in a lot of contemporary uh, writers in this, uh, and at the same time, you're bringing in commentary on feminism and and women's liberation movement and all of that. Mm-hmm. So it's both pop culture and its yeah. relevancy. Um, can you talk about that issue a little bit and what you were trying to do? Yeah, yeah it's, it's weird. Originally, of course, I was just going to do a story that, uh, you know, use some of Wolf stuff. And then suddenly when the radical chic kind of occurred to me, because I really, because I just love that piece. I mean, it, it, I, it wasn't that I, I didn't think, certainly. I mean, you know, that's why I didn't change the Hulk. It wasn't that I didn't think, of course, that, uh, uh, you know, that the, the black cause or the racial justice cause was any kind of, uh, you know, worthwhile thing. I just thought 
the way that these guys approached it, Lenny Bernstein and his friends, and you know, I have a great admiration for Bernstein as a musician, West Side Story, if nothing else, you know. And yet, I just thought it was just crazy. These people were just nuts. They didn't know what they were doing. They're playing with fire. They they're just doing it on such a shallow, casual level, and they were stupid enough to invite. Tom Wolf to come by and take a look. What do they think he's going to write? You know, they, he's going to write how sweet and smart they were. So I love this piece. And then it occurred to me that, you know, if you could do it for the Black Panthers, let's just, you know, we're taking out. I don't want to have a racial thing. Just make the uh, maybe make it about the Hulk. You know, that becomes the symbolism of the whole thing. And then I just I just kind of let it go from there. And I was lucky. Herb did a nice job. And then we had John Severin uh, inking it. And of course, he could make anything look real. Tom Wolf gave us permission to even use him as a character in there, so I didn't have to disguise anything. Uh, and uh, so as a result, you know, it just became a weird offbeat issue, and maybe we had a complaint or two about it. Mostly people just liked it. Some of those people who did that probably never heard of Tom Wolf. They never read the Radical Chic, wouldn't have known it, you know, didn't know who, what any of that stuff was. But I felt the whole thing is, as Stan always said, if it makes a good story, and it makes a good Hulk story, there's a lot of ways to do a good Hulk story. You know, Peter David had his version and, you know, this person's had that version and so forth. My particular version was doing stuff like the Golem stories and, you know, just doing stuff kind of different because I wasn't very interested in the Hulk. I mean, I like, I thought he was a fine character, but I preferred the thing. And I, you know, and I always wrote the Hulk twice. It's maybe not that issue, but generally wrote it twice as fast as anything else. And it sold better than almost anything I did. They upped the print run twice while Herb and I were doing it. It had been selling well, understand, and Herb before, but it kept selling better. Uh, but eventually, you know, I got out because I really didn't have any interest in writing that book. He's a limited character. He was just stomping around. And, you know, I was always ready to leave. I just used it as an excuse to bring in my version of the heap and to do radical chic and but that other little story, of course, that was just an accident because we had uh, the, the heaven is a very small place. Uh, we, you know, we had that month or so where we had the giant sized books, right, with the thirty something page stories, and then Goodman decided not to do that. So all of a sudden, we had to cut the stories in pieces, and I suddenly had you know all the comics had Fantastic Four had Thor had Conan had. They all had this little space where we suddenly had to cut the books up, and we had maybe a space for six, seven, eight pages we had to fill. So, I so I thought, well, I don't know, you know, Herbert, Herbert, and I would just sit around talking over, and uh, probably my idea in general. But then Herbert, I would just talk over, you know, what if the Hulk went someplace, but it's all like it's a mirage, but to him it's real, and we could see how he would try to relate to people, but it would be ultimately frustrating to him because. You know, he would never quite realize what was going on, but it wasn't really real. It was just some kind of mirage or something. And that, Can I you know, ask you, it, it had a, a, a Rod Serling Twilight Zone feel to me. And mm -hmm. and there is a similar episode of Twilight Zone, uh, Next Stop Willoughby. I don't remember. I saw a few Twilight Zones. I don't remember them. I certainly don't have any knowledge of that particular episode, but I could have seen it, I suppose. One thing I noticed about that um, Hulk issue is it was inked by John Severin, which is awesome because it had kind of like a satire cracked kind of feel to it, which I mm -hmm. thought was uh, made it a real genius little layer to add to the issue. And something that's kind of in the same flavor, I was going through like the old Rolling Stone. I think it came out in like 1970 and the Marvel bullpen was interviewed and you were in there. Oh, yeah. Robin Green. Yeah. Robin Green's article there. Yeah. I was just reading her book. Uh, yeah, and because she had a book and she worked with Rolling Stone after she worked with uh, you guys uh, for for a little while. Yeah. And there was an interesting quote, which I feel like relates to the Tom Wolf, but it also relates to something else, which I'm going to get to. You said that they do try sometimes to mix politics with superheroes and get a little more far out than apple pie. But after all, social equality and peace are the modern form of motherhood and apple pie. Everybody's in favor of peace and women's lib, at least up to a certain point. I used to be liberal, but the world has moved to the left. I think I'd rather stick with fantasy. And, and I thought that was an interesting line, and it seemed kind of similar to the Tom Wolf um, concept of your comic. Well, it might not be 100%. I don't know if she had it all down on tape, but it's, but it's probably pretty accurate. Yeah, you know, Stan and I always tried to walk in kind of middle of the road because, you know, you, we didn't really want to offend anybody, but, the, uh, you know, I mean, it, unless it was a total bigot, and, you know, so we, yeah. uh, we didn't really, you know, but... Uh, and we didn't want to look like we're trying to come down and say, you know, we've got all the answers or this side is all right. I think right. one of the stories I was always the proudest of was, what was it, the second Sons of the Serpent when I did one? And I had, it had two leaders and one was white and one was black. And I, I did that on purpose, symbolically, because I wasn't going to say all black people are evil, certainly. I'm not going to say all white people are evil. It's ridiculous. Right. So I made it, I made, 
one of each uh, being there. And I remember one of the things that uh, that I said in that story, which is that, that a cause can be right even if a leader or two is wrong. And I think, you know, that's what you have to right. remember because nobody's perfect. And all the people that are pretending they're perfect are no more perfect than anybody else. Well, if one, do you still feel like that, that the world's moved more to the left? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. And then the second thing also is, um, as far as uh, sticking with fantasy, so Tom Fagan and the Rutland Parade and hanging out mm -hmm. at his house, and, and that was like their early cosplay, you know, costume parties uh, in Super yeah. Um, tell, was that part of like just enjoying the fantasy of the characters? And tell us about what a night at Tom Fagan's house was like. It was sort of like in the comics, except without the real superheroes. No, it was just, uh, it started out, and you know, 65 was only the second comic convention ever really in New York and, and, and so forth. Uh, and I happened to be there because I had just started work. And so Tom Fagan was there and he invited me and, and the guy I was staying with, David Kaler, who had just started, I'd helped get a job writing, you know, turned out to Captain Adam and things at Charlton. And they invited us up. So we took our plastic man and Dr. Strange costumes and went up and rode on the float with him as Batman and so forth and had a good time. And over the next few years, three, four, five years, just more and more comics people heard about it, started going up until we'd have a whole bus once, I think, or something. And, uh, you know, and after a few years, it kind of died down for various reasons, you know, but uh, it had five, six years of, of, of increasing numbers of people going up. But all it really was is it was just uh, everybody kind of hanging out. We were out of the city for a change. It was a little different. A lot of these people were city people, never got out of the city. I mean, I'm a small town boy, but these were people that, you know, they spent all their lives practically in Manhattan and Queens and the Bronx you know, or something. And suddenly they're out here and walking around. It's, you know, it's a smaller city and they're walking around in the countryside and, you know, they're, they had the dam there and all kinds of stuff, and there were the woods and the mountains and so forth. And you, but but you know, I just remember freezing my fingers off by myself out there trying to do something or other with a float one year. And uh, then we'd all hop on and we'd have our costumes if we brought them, and you know, and then we'd go to a party at uh, because Tom was ba was babysitting for several years this uh, house that a uh, big house. It was a great party house, and uh, that was kind of nice, you know, and. I don't know. I just have. I don't have a lot of a lot of memories from it, except that it was just a good time, and you know, we always uh, enjoyed ourselves. And it, it, you know, I don't exactly know why it it came to an end. I know that I was up there through at least about uh, seventy two, if not else, because I remember you know I, I rented a car, drove there, and I came home with uh, in the rain with my. I think I up with Jerry and Carl before they were married as the Conways and. Uh, Came home and uh, came in the. Uh, we, we came into our apartment, and that's when uh, my, my my wife said she was, uh, you know, she wanted to leave me for a while, you know. So that's, and I don't remember anything much more about the Rutland thing after that, you know. <laughs> it seemed like in the early '70s, like 1970, you were really growing as a writer. You were um, in the publishing business, basically in New York, and you were commenting on things like Tom Wolfe and the modern social. Uh, things that were going on at the time. You were uh, had interaction with Douglas Kinney. You had an appearance in National Lampoon. Yeah. It seems like a really fertile period for you. Yeah, well, it was. You know, this it's a late it's the late sixties, the early seventies, which is really the late sixties, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And it was just interesting. I mean, the Lampoon happened to be in our you know the same building as we were, and so a lot of I never uh, tried to get real work there, but a lot of the artists, it was easy for them to get you know work there. And you had Neil Adams and a lot of others doing work. That was kind of nice. It was. You know, I'd see, you know, suddenly look at heaven, there's John and Yoko walking into the building right ahead of us. Somebody pointed it out to, to me, you know, and everything five feet away from me. And, uh, you know, then appearing in the uh, nude in the, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, National Lampoon and so forth. And, you know, that was, it was just, it was just, a, it was a different, you know, different time. It was, was pre-AIDS and pre-this and pre-that. It was post-sexual revolution. We were all in there in between. And, you know, hey, even Stan posed in the nude at one time, right? With just a little book That's in front true. of him. Or yep. Maybe it was a yep. big book. I don't know. But anyway, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, we were just reacting. That, again, it's that zeitgeist, that particular world. That's the way the world was then. I mean, there were a lot of for ferments that were very serious things. You know, you had uh, certainly the civil rights thing and uh, the anti-war movement, things like that. The, my last question, we've talked about sure. uh, literary awareness and we talked about um, the influence of Tom Wolfe as, as a literary journalist and how that 
inspired you to, to be somewhat of a commentator on, on some things. Uh, my last question is, I want to go back to your first job, though, as a history teacher. I didn't teach history then. I had a history major, but I ended up teaching English. Ah, well, that makes sense, too. Um, but you, with with the Invaders and then All-Star Squadron, it seemed mm -hmm. like you were teaching readers both world history and comics history simultaneously. Um, and that became a, a big aspect of your career, starting really with Avengers 97 and Godhood's End, um, and then in 1971, and then Giant Size Invaders really taking it to another level, uh, and the 21 issues of Invaders. But what I primarily want to talk about is, in relation to all this, is your experience doing the Invaders Annual number one. And if you could tell us what that was and uh, how it came to be and who you were working with, uh, Robbins, Enrico, and Elias. Yeah, that was, a, that was a very special issue to me because it became the one, as it turned out, only Invaders Annual. And, I, and of course, uh, naturally, the first thing I thought of, if I've got all these extra pages, I'm going to, as usual, turn it into the Justice Society of America which I turned everything into if I could, um, you know, and I had done that with the first Avengers annual I wrote, you know, which was treated like that. So in this case, I decided, well, you know, I was going to do this thing just like uh, the old All-Star comics when I was reading it, where I'd have the beginning and ending with the characters together, and then I would have the three different heroes, at least luckily it was only three main heroes, uh, each of them would have his own chapter, it would be uh, drawn by somebody who had uh, drawn the comic in the past, you know, possible. I mean, they weren't all around, but I, I couldn't get everybody I wanted. You know, I don't think, uh, uh, I guess Bill, Bill Everett was already dead. So, uh, so I, I got, went to Lee Elias who hated the sub -Mariner. He always said that, but I got him to draw the pencil, at least the sub -Mariner chapter. That was sort of interesting just to have him do it. I liked his work on the flash and so forth. Uh, and, um, uh, I had Don Rico had become a friend. Don had been, you know, a, a writer and artist at Timely, and he'd done a little Captain America back in the 40s. And we were friends. You know, he and uh, Sergio Aragonis and Mark Evanier a little later would, uh, would co found that CAPS organization out in LA of comic book people. And, I, and Don was really a, a very nice, urbane, uh, great guy and so forth. So I thought it'd be nice to have him draw Captain America. But the real thing was getting the human torch, you know. Uh, I mean, I guess I could have got Dick Ayers, who had done it in the 50s, because he was around. but I wanted to get somebody from the 40s, and so I went to Carl Burgess, whom I never met. I never met Carl Burgess, unfortunately, but I talked to him on the phone, and he agreed to do it. And uh, then he reneged, because, you know, he had got to really, you know, hate, not me or Marvel, but more like Stan. He thought, I don't know, somehow, it was really Martin Goodman who was his real enemy, because, you know, he's the one that took Captain Human Torch from him, not Stan. But he didn't like Marvel, and so I guess he, it, when he really push came to shove, he just couldn't bring himself to do it or something. So he very politely called up and begged off on the phone, and so I, I was really kind of depressed. I had no 1940s person to do uh, the torch, and for some and at the but in the meantime, I had contacted Alex Schomburg because he had been the guy who had drawn all those great uh, 1940s World War II uh, Marvel mystery covers and and other Marvel covers with. Uh, with great battles and five million characters and everything's labeled. And I thought that would, and he was doing the cover. So I said, Hey, you know, I knew he had done a few comics. Strangely enough, I don't know if he ever did interior stories for timely, but he did a lot for standard. Yeah. Right. You know, he uh, did some he, Westerns you know. and some other stuff. Yeah. yeah. But not, yeah, but he didn't do that much for, and he never did the superhero stories for Marvel. But I said, you know, listen, would you like to do a five, six page thing with a human torch? And it was weird because we we're working Marvel style, you know, and everything, which she certainly had never done, you know, just giving him the plot. And then I'd write the dialogue later. He said, yeah, it might be fun. And he did a nice job. And, and I have probably the, one of the only Marvel stories, you know, with a superhero ever drawn by uh, Alex Schomburg. So I still miss the fact that I didn't get to work with Carl Burgess, but I got to work mm -hmm. with Alex Schomburg. So, so it was kind of nice. It was kind of a, a fun story. And of course, Frank Robbins could tie it all together. And he, because he really knew that World War II stuff. And with all his weird qualities that uh, he was, uh, you know, a magnificent artist too. So it's a, it's a very special book to be. And it goes back not just to your love of Golden Age, but also to your early uh, career too, because it brings in and ties in with that Avengers issue with the Squadron uh, Sinister. Yeah. And which I had been waiting for forever for that. So for me, it was a very special book as well. I, I didn't know I was because it never occurred to me that I'd write the story behind why Captain America is 
using the you know the, the old shield at the time of course it was just to differentiate him from the regular captain america and uh, you know and and why, why the submariner was wearing this and so forth but uh once i had done those stories i thought well you know uh i'll do it but then i have if i do that i have to explain why is captain america using the wrong shield and why is this and why is that why is submariner got these old trunks on that he actually wore in the comics when we've got him in this scaly stuff that bill didn't introduce until the 50s and uh, so that just became part of the fun just the same way was with, with with the co retroactive continuity in all-star squadron you find the problem and merely finding the problem makes you think that you're going to have fun finding a solution you know and everything because if you just it's if you start off with a problem it gives you something to kind of you know butt up against and you know uh, as opposed to just writing a story you're having to solve a particular problem and, and tell a good story at the same time and if somebody didn't like what I was doing uh, because they didn't like the idea of retroactive continuity, well, I just have to get by without those people. And, you know, for the most part, I did. Not long enough, but, you know, uh, but still 60, 70 issues of All-Star Squadron before Crisis uh, ruined it all. And, uh, you know, a number of issues Invaders. I should have written all the Invaders myself. Uh, not that Don Glute and others didn't do it a good job but i should have written all that and I, you know i think i could have guided it because then it would have been more a personal statement but you know i was busy living you know my life with uh you know dating and marriages and moving from one coast to the other and different things you know and you know and i just wanted to say um because my time's running out i i just wanted to say that when people ask me who my favorite marvel people are I always say three, and they're they're Hawkeye, Division, and Captain America. All three of those, mm. it's because of the stamp that you put on those characters. And I just want to say, as a seven-year-old that was reading that when you were writing it, did I, I put a stamp on Hawkeye? I don't know. <laughs> for well, I, I should say Clint Barton more than just saying Hawkeye. Oh, well, Clint Barton. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I get yeah because he didn't have a life before that. Uh, right. Yeah, I guess. Right. That's yeah. that's exactly right. So for me. I got to say, you were always the man for me. Oh, well, I was the boy, really. Stan was the man, you know, and everything. <laughs> well, thank goodness you kept me gainfully employed during that period then, you know, <laughs> you know, and everything. So I'm very happy. And now, they're, now, of course, they're uh, keeping me not happily uh, quasi unemployed because they keep paying me for reprinting this stuff, you know. And, That's and, uh, nice. you know, There you go. I like, I, you know, I mean, it's not like a uh, huge buddy, but it, it enables me to, to live nicely and not have to get by on social security they're paying all the stuff that as i write a little thing i don't have to the, you know at this stage i don't have to do anything i don't want to do you know nobody can uh you know har harm me or damage my reputation because i don't care you know if they, <laughs> they stop doing conventions if they stop doing paying me to come to conventions i just won't go and i'll live quite happily if they have conventions i'll go and i'll do that quite happily you know and uh, and something i'd throw out there um as we uh, as we wrap up is that um you know, Julius Schwartz is often credited as the guy that brought a lot of science fiction and a lot of uh, critical um, thinking and thought to a lot of those Silver Age characters. And I would mm -hmm. say that the person at Marvel that was really putting that sci-fi stuff and expanding the mm -hmm. Marvel Universe uh, for, on a science fiction mm -hmm. level with things like the Kree Scroll mm -hmm. War, that was you, Roy. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Julie was, I, I will say that Julie was an influence on me, even when I was at Marvel, because I still liked that stuff. I mean, you know, I realized it was at a more juvenile level of Stan stuff, but I still liked it. You know, I could still, re I just got into a little one set, and I could still read The Flash and Hawkman, even though it wasn't, you know, written on the same plane that, you know, the little slightly more adult plane that you know, some of the Marvel stuff was. But, but I was very influenced by Julian, very impressed, and I liked the fact that he did this. And Stan didn't like, you know, parallel world stuff, you know, but I found ways to bring it in with what if and different things. Uh, he would never have been in favor of doing a world, a comic set all in World War II. He just used that for a few Captain America stories because he didn't know what else to do with him. But to me, you know, that was the way to do it. Why should all stories be set in one or two eras like the West and, you know, and, uh, you know, and the, and the far future and the present? Why not have a World War II? Why, I, I would have loved to have done a World War I comic, but I never quite got the chance, you know. Yeah. But World War II, for some reason, was especially interesting, even though I don't remember it. I. I was just always fascinated by World War II and the home front stuff, especially. And people would ask me, why are you so interested in the, the World War II? I said, well, it's one of the few times that humanity ever got together to do anything well. I mean, the whole world just about, unlike World War, they were practically all involved in everything. And it, it was an awful, terrible thing. And it's not like I seriously would want to 
repeat anything like it. But the fact remains, you have to you have to admire the fact that the whole damn planet just about was involved. Anywhere you went, it was at least a background thing, you know. Yeah. Even if you were in a neutral country or you were in Africa or whatever, there was always something going on, you know, a la Casablanca or something. And that just, you know, fascinated me. And I feel that, you know, World War II is like the Roman Empire or the Civil War or something. You know, just there are an infinite number of possibilities. There's something I'd love to do, a Civil War superhero story, you know. There you go. You might do a better version than the one that Marvel actually did. Did they do one? Yeah, at some point, yeah. Stan, I never read the stories that much. I, you know, I like the movie they made out of it. Uh, I, but Stan, I remember Stan must have. Uh, he thought that was what. I don't know if he was talking about the individual story or just the concept. But I remember he talking to him on the phone once. And he said that he thought that Civil War idea was one of the best that he'd seen in you know comics and everything. But you know, he's not necessarily talking about so much the actual stories as the the concept. But of course, that came out of you know stuff that he had done too. I mean, you know, the scenes of all that stuff are all set back in what Stan did with Jack and. Steve and so forth. You know, you could always trace anything that they do do now or that I did then. It's it's all kind of traceable back. It all kind of flows from the the this fountain that was unleashed when Stan and Jack and to a lesser extent Ditko, you know, got together and suddenly became this wonderful triumvirate, creating a whole universe. And you know, uh, I mean, that Stan and Jack in particular were just the absolutely you know irreplaceable essential parts of that neither of them could have really you know done it without the other although they didn't do it at the time yeah yeah there's definitely a magic that happened in the 60s in new york yeah. uh, at that building it's like Lennon and mccartney or you know whatever you know something two two people or three people get together and all of a sudden something comes out that's much better than any one of them you know would have done a part you know uh, and everything and I, I was lucky enough to come along and you know, be a junior partner in that, and I could carry it forward a little bit. I, you know, I've got in the same league with, uh, in terms of importance by any standard, with uh, guys like that and a number of others. But at the same time, you know, I could contribute my own little bit. Uh, you know, trying more just to have fun and make a living, and maybe contribute a little because I always love the uh, the comics medium. Obviously, even if I don't read comics now that much, except the old ones. Uh, you know, I just I love the idea of comics. I love the medium and the storytelling and it's it's sort of been nice to see the world catch up with us a little bit, you know. Even if they have to movies and TV shows to do it, uh, to to uh, you know, the world kind of has to admit now, you know, maybe there is something to to some of this stuff, you know. The critics hate it; they they hate the superhero movies because they hate having to take the stuff seriously. They can't ignore it. Yeah, that's true. They can't ignore it at this point. Before we uh, before we close out, can you tell us about? Um if you can, uh, in, in, and meeting Kirby and meeting Ditko when you joined in the 60s uh, at Marvel, like interacting with them, uh, what was your first impression of both of them? The funny thing is, I don't remember, you know, I don't remember the event of meeting either of them. I remember meeting the day I met John Romita. Uh -huh. I remember the day I met Bill Everett and, of course, Stan, you know, and whatever. But I don't remember specifically meeting uh, Ditko just would drop by and so forth. I was introduced to him in passing. And by that time, I was, you know, I already knew that he and Stan weren't speaking. So I didn't know what to say to him. I could just kind of be quiet. Uh, Jack came in. It was just very funny. But I don't remember the first time I ever did. I just I just remember Jack was an interesting guy. I just, I'll say one little thing. One, one lunch I was out with. I don't, Stan wasn't there because he might not have said it was Stan was there. But, he, but uh, Ramita, Saul Brodsky, myself, maybe Stan Goldberg. Five, six of us would go to a, a trash when had good ice cream. We'd just, you know, have lunch. And uh, I was the junior partner. I was the youngest guy there. So, I'm, you know, you know I, I would just try to listen to what they said and uh, learn some stuff. But I remember somebody, Ramita or somebody asking, uh, what's going to be the next trend, Jack? This is about 1966, 67, you know, before he moved out west. And uh, Stan says, Jack says, you know, I don't know any better than anybody else. He says, you know, but I said, I'll tell you one thing. When there's the next train, it's not going to be me. It's not going to come from me, and it's not going to come from Stanley, and it's not going to come from these guys in DC. It's going to come from two guys in a garage somewhere. And I thought of that when I thought of things like the Teenage Ninja Turtles and things, where some just you know it's just the inspiration of one or two people getting together and and doing something. It doesn't have to. It won't necessarily come from the big companies. It'll just the same way that Siegel and Schuster created Superman, you know, before they were with a company, you know, and. And uh, I, I just thought, you know, Jack, Jack was an interesting guy. He had a, an unsophisticated mind in some way, but he was such a genius in his own way that, uh, you know, he couldn't help. Anytime he said anything, you know, there's, you know, even if it was nuts in a little ways, there was bound to be something interesting in it. 
I, I, I found him kind of fascinating, although I never you know knew him that well. While Stan, of course, was more down to earth, but was uh, you know his whole thing was you know just running the company and trying to promote Marvel and the creativity part. To, to Jack, the creativity was the important thing, and Stan was very creative and, and so forth. But to, to to Stan, the creativity was the means to the end. To, you know, to, because his job was to run the company and make money for the company, and of course, maybe side promote the company and promote himself along with it. That was the, that wasn't necessarily what Mark Goodman wanted to do. That's what Stan wanted to do. Uh, but you know, they were both different, but they were both promoting the comics in their in their own way. And I think comics sort of needed both. They needed the creativity. And they needed something different from creativity. You know, I mean, I can't ever see Jack Kirby ever starting anything like Marvel Comics with the continuity and the this and the that. I can't see him doing that, even if he was the editor, you know. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, maybe he could have done it after Marvel, but certainly not before. On the other hand, Stan would never have been able to create Marvel and get it going if he had Jack Kirby or somebody else very much like him because Stan wasn't going to come up with all these ideas totally by himself. He would be dependent on a, a, a really good artist. And uh, of course, in Jack, he had the best, you know, and then he got lucky with Ditko, who nobody ever heard of or cared anything about. It turned out to be one of the two or three most important superhero artists of all time that DC probably wouldn't have hired on a bet at that time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because they were kind of focused on that smooth Dan Barry ink line, and they didn't really. Yeah, he would he would he would have been considered just a mediocre artist to them. You know, I was a fan of Ditko since he was doing Captain Adam the first time in the late fifties. You know, a couple of years earlier, and I thought this guy's really pretty good. You know, the, so as soon as he started drawing Spider Man, I recognized who he was just as I knew who Kirby was. I'd know who Kirby, or at least Simon and Kirby. I had known that was a symbol for good quality and artwork since I was five or six years old back in. 46, 47. Yeah, those were great books. Boy Commandos and News, Newsboy Legion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I was thinking, that, of course, by that time, they really weren't doing that much anymore, but they were sort of people were following them. I, uh, I think I became aware of them more uh, from like things like Stuntman and so forth. Oh, yeah. That's classic, too. Just beautiful stuff, you know, just, just wonderful stuff. I didn't know who Simon was or who Kirby was and who did what. You know, and once in a while, Simon could pull off a thing that was just like Kirby. But, uh, you know, anyway, so there, so you, there you have it. I just tried to, you know, be the, the, the sixth wheel on the thing that Kirby and Simon did. So anyway, we got to go. Thanks again, Roy. Uh, this has been another uh, fun episode of the Comic Book Historians podcast with Alex Grant and Jim Thompson. We had a really fantastic guest today, Mr. Roy Thomas, Roy the Boy and the uh, second editor-in-chief of Marvel, of the Marvel Age, after Stan Lee, his hair apparent culturally and uh, comic writing-wise, and he took that into his own legacy in comics. Roy, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Roy. Sure.